Okay, folks, so we, um, we'll make a, make a start, try and stick to time. Um, so you're all very welcome um, to the Belfast Room here in the um, Ulster Museum. My name is Maurice from Corrig. I'm Head of Politics and International Relations at Queen's. Uh, we're delighted you could make it here uh, this evening uh, for our Queen's Annual Politics lectures, uh, Lecture. The lecture is funded by the R. N. Jones Memorial Lecture Fund and is to invite scholars of international distinction uh, to come to present their research uh, at the university. Um, we are honoured to have here for the 2024 uh, on your politics lecture, Professor Tony Hostrup from the University of Manchester. By way of background, Professor Hostrup was an undergraduate student of the University of California, Davis. She moved to the University of Cape Town for her graduate degree and then on to the University of Edinburgh for her doctoral research, where she investigated EU-Africa relations. She since worked at the University of Kent uh, in 2019, joined the University of Stirling before joining the University of Manchester as chair in global politics in 2023. Her research interrogates the manifestation of power hierarchies in global politics with research interests encompassing a wide range of topics within international studies, including peace and security in Africa, feminist, post-colonial and decolonial approaches to international relations and regional and global governance. And she has published extensively in these areas. In addition to her academic work, Professor Ostrup frequently works with government organs and international organizations, offering expertise on themes linked to the women, peace and security agenda and feminist foreign policy. She provides occasional commentary to news media on current affairs related to Africa's international relations and Western foreign policies in Africa. In 2022, she was awarded the Flax Foundation's Emma Goldman Award for her work on feminist and inequality issues in Europe. She was also awarded that year the Emma Goldman Fellowship of the Vienna Institute for Human Sciences, and last year, she was the recipient of an independent Social Research Foundation Mid-Career Fellowship for 23-24. She's also currently the chair of the University Association of, for Contemporary European Studies. So uh, we're extremely honoured to have her here today uh, to, prevent, to present the 2024 Annual Politics Lecture, titled, as you can see, Contestations and Reconciliations, Knitting Alternative Versions of Peace. So a warm welcome to you, Professor. All right, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here at um, Queen's in Belfast. I don't know that I'm a scholar of international renown, but I certainly know a lot of people in this room. Um, when I was trying to decide on a title for this, because I'm going to speak about a project that is ongoing, I was trying to see the ways in which I could appeal to who would be my audience there. So I've got knitting in there, that's for Vivian and Elodie. <laughs> I've got peace in there and contestations and that's more for Maria, Hannah and of course, Jamie. But hopefully everybody here will find something in there for them. Um, this particular project is what's coming out and what's motivated the project that is funded by the Independent Social um, Science Research Foundation. Um, as I said, it's still ongoing, um, but I thought I would speak a bit about what the motivation was uh, and then speak a bit about um, some of the questions that I'm asking and it feels like I still keep asking uh, those questions. Um, as I was introduced, uh, you will notice that I do quite a lot of things research-wise. One is on Africa, um, particularly the African Union, by which I mean um, the states within the African Union. Um, and I also work on the European Union. Um, and the reason I came to work on this two, some would say similar, I don't think they're that similar, um, organization, this because of something that happened in my penultimate year as an undergrad. Um, I'm from Nigeria, and um, Nigeria is one of the founding members of what used to be the Organization of African Unity, which is, uh, which is succeeded by the EU. So all my life, I've known about regional organizations, but until this particular day in college, I uh, had never heard of the EU. I'd heard of NATO, because nobody really liked NATO. And, but I had not heard of the EU. 
And I thought it was so fascinating, but I also thought it was very odd that they were talking about regionalism, regional organizations, issues around how regionalism or regional organizations can facilitate a peace, but there was absolutely no mention of the OAU or indeed ECOWAS or SADA, which are different regional organizations. And so this is what sort of spurred my interest in the Intervening years, I've gone on to do other things like women, peace, and security, and feminist foreign policy. In a sense, all of those things come together in this project. I was fascinated by the fact that although a lot of the discourse around regionalism and its link to peace, which centered very much in the European Union, suggested that regionalism was a potential way to peace, why were we necessarily finding that in the case of Africa, especially when these beliefs seem to have been internalized by Africans themselves? And this is where I think the contestations come in. And I keep asking myself this question as a feminist. Um, so today, I want to talk about, you know, the broader context of uh, peace and security in Africa. Some of the puzzles that I'm still, there were the puzzles that influenced sort of the proposal for this, but I'm still grappling with them. And then I want to speak to the idea of Pan-Africanism, um, which in all this journey to date, thinking about regionalism and theorizing regionalism, at the level of international studies, despite all of the other things we might say about Europe, Pan-Africanism doesn't really feature in the mainstream discourses. And I try to explain why, and then talk through some of the alternatives, particularly when we start thinking about Pan-Africanism and um, feminism. And I should say, even as I go along, those contestations are still there. And I try to conclude which isn't really a conclusion because, as I said, the project is ongoing, so you have to ask me back next year. <laughs> right, so when we think about context of insecurity in Africa, I'm sure a lot of what I will tell you is not new, right? Um, probably more than any time since decolonization, Africa is married in a range of different conflicts. Um, 10 years ago, if I was standing here, I would have said the same thing, probably since, no since decolonization, you know. And, of course, it's a bit sad, but I think much more critically, it's also odd that in the aftermath of the Cold War, we saw a wave, significant wave of democratization, significant wave of folks um, demanding both their civil, social, and economic rights. So how did we get from the aftermath of the Cold War, where there was a lot of promise around peace and security for ordinary people, and where we are at the moment, where we have an ongoing genocide that nobody seems to be paying attention to in Sudan, um, the Anglophone conflict in Cameroon, a range of coups a in Francophone West Africa, where women and other gender minorities still bear the brunt of a lot of this insecurity. But at the same time, there are different articulations of peace that don't necessarily make it into any textbook or um, any of the popular discourses. So it's all tied to think together about, you know, what is happening a that I'm hearing, for example, from Sudanese feminists and how that is not making it to international studies is part of the reason why I'm wanting to do this. Because in a sense, the erasure is happening on two different levels. On one level, in the context of something like the African Union that was founded specifically for peace and security purposes, there doesn't seem to be a lot of entry point for the sorts of things that Sudanese, Cameroonian, other African feminists and the diaspora seem to be demanding. And yet, we are told that regional integration, regional governance could be a means towards peace. On the other hand, 
feminists, I think, have argued very effectively about why we need a feminist piece. And I'll show you some quotes from some of the work that has already been done. But by and large, Africa doesn't feature, beyond simply being a case study, not a site of theorizing what feminism and feminist peace could mean. We know, of course, that this context is happening because of what I call crisis in the aftermath of colonization, which I've spoken about, but also crises that have resulted um, as a result of, I think, gendered insecurities fostered by a hierarchical global political system. And again, this brings together evidence from some of the other work we've done, both at the EU level, um, but also in Africa. But when we're talking about Africa specifically, and in particular, the African Union, there is a fundament that um, underpins this drive towards regional integration and the belief that regional integration and regional governance can bring peace, and that's Pan-Africanism. By and large, as I said, we don't really talk about that, uh, even though we have a lot of other examples of concepts that is used, for example, uh, in the European, on the European side, whether you're looking at NATO or the European Union. So I decided to dig a bit into Pan-Africanism. One of the tenets of Pan-Africanism is global solidarity. So the idea, of course, that you want greater integration amongst people of African descent, and that then obviously includes not just folks who are living in Africa, but within the diaspora, and therefore you would see, for example, connections between Sudan as much as um, Haiti, that there's something that binds us together. And I think a lot of us know what. Um, but there should be global solidarity as a means to us trying to find solutions to what some of the challenges of international politics might be. Another dimension of Pan-Africanism, which sort of emerges, of course, um, out of uh, colonialism, out of sort of trying to find a reckoning for the, um, the devastation of slavery, is trying to challenge global hierarchies of power wherever they occur whether it's within the international system or within states themselves. And of course, this has evolved because we didn't always have the states that we have now when um, Pan-Africanism emerged. But I think one of the things that has changed with respect to Pan-Africanism is now through the OAU uh, and now the AU, there's been an attempt to institutionalize Pan-Africanism. One of the questions I then had is, can we still derive liberation, which is the ultimate goal of Pan-Africanism, from this process of institutionalization, not the least when the institutions are quite similar to the very ones that we consider to be hierarchical and foster some of the inequalities within the global political economy. But nevertheless, I would argue that it is one path, one ontology of peace, the one that the African Union suddenly believes in, and suddenly, rhetorically, the ones that a lot of African elites tend to speak of. On the other hand, we are in a moment where a lot of people don't like it, but we can actually talk publicly about feminism and peace. We've got things like the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. We've got something called feminist foreign policy. And I do have mixed feelings about both of those things, but it's there and we can talk about feminism. And it actually shares some similarities to what it is that Pan-Africanism is trying to do. Challenging systems of oppression, wanting to transform and transform, transformative challenging gender power hierarchies. But at the same time, one of the things that the scholarship on feminist peace has shown is that this process is untidy, it's complex, and coexists within a range of contradictions. And I think this is where you definitely see the contestations. I would say within Pan-Africanism as well, particularly given the point I made earlier about what happens when you institutionalize. Increasingly, we are seeing these two things come together. And there's been a lot of scholarship, a lot of knowledge produced about the linkages between Pan-Africanism and feminism. It's just not happening in international studies. So one of the questions I'm asking in the context of this project, and I think it's a really important question for us, is often uh, I speak to the processes of knowledge production and the challenges of knowledge production 
And then we look at hierarchies on the other hand for that knowledge reproducing cells, but often they don't speak to each other. So this becomes something that is entangled in the process of this research. Where are the gendered, hier gendered and racialized hierarchies in the process of knowledge production and how does it inform what we then get out of it so that it can have that transformative liberation that we actually want? This again is not resolved yet, but I think it's an important one. Because I'm a feminist scholar, I spend a lot of time delving into feminist conceptions of peace. And a lot of the work around feminist peace research has come out, I would say, in the last decade. And I thought these quotes were really useful for my own thinking. One, the first one by Karenas says, peace is conditional on the achievement of equality and freedom, meaning the realization of both self-determination and human rights. And I think this is really important, this idea of self-determination, which again, in the context of African peace and security, neither ordinary Africans or indeed even the problematic elites seem to have self-determinations because of this global hierarchical system. And invariably, those in most impacts are those who are already extremely marginalized. Feminist conceptions of peace also help us highlight that violence has to be seen on a continuum of structurally, structural inequality and gendered power relations. And finally, Faldutra Santos says, there is no single uncontested definition of feminist peace. And it is precisely because of that that this work becomes important because I want to understand what feminist peace means for Africans, which might be very different, for example, to what feminist peace might mean for Ukrainians, for example, to take um, an ongoing conflict. Through the Women, Peace and Security agenda, there has been an attempt to articulate this feminist peace for institutionally. And in a sense, this is where I first started encountering how we might think about feminist peace in the African context a bit differently. A few years ago, I did some research that focused specifically on the entry of Women, Peace and Security agenda, which um, is based on the adoption of a UN Security Council resolution in 13, 1325 in 2000. At least that's the origin story that we tell. But when we're looking at Africa, we realize that what we call women, peace, and security today, or indeed the aspirations of what we call women, peace, and security today, of course started well before 2000. Not only that, African feminists and African women's rights activists were very instrumental to the construction of what could even go to the UN Security Council. And I think this untold story of the women, peace, and security agenda further demonstrates the hierarchies that exist, not just within the practices of global politics, but in the practices of knowledge production itself. And Jamie and I have done some work on that. But we also see, of course, women, peace, and security is not just happening within universities. It's not just happening in think tanks. There's a lot of advocacy around women, peace, and security within civil society, both civil society in Africa and the broader global south, and indeed here in the global north. So there is a sense that women, peace, and security is something that we're all in together, at least amongst those of us who might be feminists. In Africa, there's a quest for greater institutionalization of women, peace, and security, which again is very much driven by um, reports that are coming from the UN, the, the, the fact that funders want us to do more women, peace, and security work. But it goes back to my earlier question, what happens when we try to institutionalize liberatory movements? But attempts to sort of counter the ways in which bringing together possibly feminism, pan-Africanism, we can see that through, for example, the continental results framework, which although sort of is, uh, it's, um, framework to evaluate the extent to which women, peace, and security has been institutionalized, but deviates a bit from what you might find in other contexts because it adds an additional dimension which acknowledges emerging security challenges specifically 
to make room for and acknowledge the fact that a lot of the security challenges that emerge for Africa, Africans don't really have a lot of control over it. Not only that, um, to really highlight the fact that a lot of external actors also have responsibilities for the security challenges. So you can't have a state or an international organization or institution come in and say, we will fund women, peace and security for Africa, but not acknowledge the sources of the security challenges on the continent. In this process of institutionalization, one of the questions I therefore ask is, what room does this leave for Afro-conceptions of feminism? Since a lot of the feminisms that come from WPS has really watered down the, what I find to be African aspirations, but at the same time, really pushing for an institutionalization of women, peace, and security. As I said, for me, when we're thinking about feminist peace research, I think the nature of global hierarchies means that Global North voices have been overrepresented, including around conversations of peace research. And I sort of see this as a, being on the continuum of some of the other work that I'm doing, um, especially around feminist foreign policy. But in the context of all of this, where we're, we seem to be trying really hard to do everything we must, whether it's through the institutionalization of women, peace, and security, or through discourses around feminist peace, why is it that we're still here? Why does everything feel like it's still in a stalemate or it keeps getting worse? And one of the things you find by taking a feminist lens, but also going back to some of the foundational texts around Pan-Africanism, as well as contemporary articulations thereof, is that at the heart of ongoing challenges to Africa's well-being, and I use that specifically, it's well-being, because it's not just about the conflicts, are specific historic and contemporary power dynamics and structures of gendered and racialized oppression that perpetrate violence not just physical violence. I'm talking about, yes, physical violence, but I'm also talking about economic violence, like the significant amount of debt injustice. So the very practices of capitalism influence and impact on peace. Racism, of course, has not gone away anywhere. Misogyny, but also um, Perceptions of the African continent as being subordinated to other regions of the world continue to impact both how we conceive of peace um, on the continent from the outside and what is actually possible in practice. So, as context, two puzzles that then animate this work. What are the options for peace in a context of multiple crises where ostensibly emancipatory practices like the women, peace, and security agenda reproduces existing hierarchies, not the least because of the exclusion of some of the fundaments of what Africans might want? And how do we confront the structures of oppression and governance that are implicated in the state of the African continent today? And here, I want to then go back to Pan-Africanism, because I often find that this is the thing that folks are least familiar with. And one of the f my fascinations with it is that over the last decade, in sort of trying to research this area, I found a lot of African feminists referring to themselves, not just as African feminists, but specific specifically Pan-Africanist feminists. And I wanted to understand what that meant, because, again, it has a very, very specific lineage and I've done that through talking to a lot of them. I will um, speak to how I've gone about that in, in a moment. So Amina Abbas, um, who is a British Nigerian academic feminist, um, sorry, Hakim, Hakim Abbas and Amina Mama, who um, is the feminist uh, academic, both of them, in a special issue in Feminist Africa um, about a decade ago, defined Pan-Africanism as an insurrectionary discourse that emerged in direct opposition to European capitalism manifest in the worst forms of human exploitation and occupation. I think that this is an acceptable definition, but I did wonder to what extent did women, peace, and security in Africa 
actually reflect any of this? To what extent does the practices of the African Union, who has also committed to this ideal, reflect Pan-Africanism as is understood here? In more recent work, um, Pan-Africanism is said to offer a global perspective on coloniality and an approach within global resistances to oppression and in solidarity with collective global efforts towards liberation. So these are the definitions I'm getting of Pan-Africanism when I'm engaging with feminists, which begs my question again, to what extent do our institutions actually reflect that? Interestingly enough, I think that the emergent feminist peace research actually has significant overlaps with what the aspirations of uh, Pan-Africanism is. And I have this quote from Katia Confrontini, where she talks about what feminist peace is and what feminist peace research can do. And she says it's about recovering that which is hidden and goes beyond recovering voices and people who have traditionally been excluded from ranks of so-called experts. It includes recovering concepts and ideas, exposing the always but not all only gendered operations of power that are involved in normalizing all sorts of violence, including direct, structural, slow, and epistemic. This quote becomes significant for me because it defines why I'm doing this particular research. So what happens when the research is done? To what extent are we able to actually foster alternatives to what it is that we have now? To do this, I pay a lot of attention um, to discourses, and not just discourses on paper, but by engaging with different types of people. So I sort of identify four different areas where I can sort of pull the work of liberation that is pan-Africanist um, and feminist. One is through legal and normative frameworks. Again, things that don't necessarily hear that much about because Africa tends to be quite marginalized in both our conversations about peace, but also about feminism, even though it features so prominently at the same time. So you've sort of got this um, hyper-visible hyper-visible invisibility going on. So you've got legal and normative frameworks. Um, you've got the Maputo Protocol, uh, which is probably the fastest ratified charter on the African continent and is considered um, very emancipatory um, as a framework it is considered very, very progressive, and the process of actually coming to the protocol was considered very inclusive. But outside of that legal framework, you've got something like the African Feminist Charter, which articulates what sort of vision of Africa is possible. And we actually find some of the, this vision also articulated in um, the African Union's blueprint um, for Africa's liberation, which is Agenda 2063. But you also sort of see moments through which Pan-Africanist feminisms emerge historically through the Pan-Africanist conferences, which is quite fascinating because Pan-Africanism historically has also been very gendered, it's lots of exclusion of women, but the ideas that inhabit it are some that very much overlap with the ways in which we think feminist peace should be. But also key moments in history like Beijing in 1994, but also the emergence of feminist foreign policy where you have African feminists challenging some of the ontologies of feminist foreign policy, but at the same time using that to say we want an emancipatory and a liberatory understanding of feminism, which isn't just about gender equality, but has to look at things like debt injustice, right? Um, I've already talked about women, peace, and security agenda, but also the sustainable development goals. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about this, what I would call global feminist movements, if I go back to the earlier point, 
Pan Africanism feminists see global solidarity as being essential. So, taking it from Pan Africanism, but certainly the feminism as well, we don't, they don't necessarily think that they can do it alone, but they think that there is a specificity in what is happening in Africa that is often not recognized, even when they are willing to recognize in solidarity with others. One of the other fascinating things about this process is also, as someone you sort of started looking at the African Union, really interested in institutions, um, a lot of this stuff happens outside of the institutions, but interestingly enough, they want to engage with the institutions partly because there's a realization that the institutions want power, but there's also a certain skepticism of the institution that, well, that's not really where you would find liberation. And I found it really interesting because I asked questions like, oh, have we got women, peace, and security? Like, you know, that could potentially be an entry point. It's like, yeah, we acknowledge that. It is definitely one layer of feminism, but the liberation that we want for the African continent that can produce peace, is going to happen through coalition, excuse me, coalition building amongst um, feminists of African descent, so not just the ones on the continent. And that is mostly enabled through social media. And finally, you've got those who are willing to work actively with the institution. The African Union is the only organization I know that sort of has a structure a permanent relationship with a feminist coalition of civil society organization that shadows every year's agenda. This is known as the Gender is My Agenda campaign, and they're very instrumental to all the feminist entry points. So in 2025, the focus of the African Union is reparations, and part of their work is to present a feminist case for reparations. So we do this around Athens. The Austrian Kizier, they go back for a further 30 minutes. Stop talk. Stop your biscuits. That's the by the shop. Sure. Baby. We've got 30 minutes, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we see that even though we're not talking about what Pan Africanism and feminism have to do together or what they offer, it is happening. And I'm simply trying to sort of think about how do we then bring it into the ways in which we do conceptualize feminist peace. To do that work, the sorts of feminists I spoke to were, of course, those who do work within the institutions or who previously worked within the institutions. But increasingly, as I said, there are lots of folks who are self-identifying as Pan-Africanist feminists. And I trace them through a range of different collectives. Um, there's a Nawi collective where their focus is almost solely around macroeconomics and the inequality of macroeconomics. And I think, again, for me, that was really fascinating because as a very much international security person, it probably wouldn't have automatically occurred to me about the ways in which you can think about macroeconomics in a, for a sustained period and sort of link it to... Um, we certainly know we can link it to injustice, but certainly sort of thinking about how it facilitates insecurity. We also have the NALA Collective, whose focus has mostly been to definitely work with institutions, to work with those elites in Africa, to sort of help transform ideas around what women should be doing, um, thinking about gender minorities more broadly, but also sort of fostering into generational dialogue um, and thinking through how can that then be um, used in terms of substantive policy. And two years ago, I was part of a collective that sought to respond to the mushrooming, I should say, of feminist foreign policy. Most of some of you might know here that uh, feminist foreign policy is now about 10 years old. But I often find it really interesting that a lot of countries that had feminist foreign policy had feminist foreign policy towards the global south, including African countries, right? So when Sweden is thinking about its feminist foreign policy, it's not thinking, how am I getting a feminist foreign policy to the United States? Um, it's, you know, what does feminist foreign policy look like for, I don't know, South Africa or Cameroon, whatever. Um, and 
in the conversations we're having with members of this collective, the same things, overlapping things between some of the stuff that comes from Nala, some of what comes from Nawi, amongst many others, FemNet keep coming up, you know, debt injustice, problems of capitalism, increased militarization, um, which again happens because elites are invested in it in Africa, but certainly happening because of the um, um, gendered power dynamics within the international system are things that are essential to articulating a Pan-African feminist peace. And so, at the end of it all, I have this definition. I do not know if it's complete just yet because I've still got a bit of time on that project. But when I look at this definition, it's pretty. But I also think it's very much imbued with those contestations that I mentioned at the very beginning. At the same time, it does offer an alternative to what we have now. It is very much a vision, a power of feminist vision of peace is one that demands the interrogation of those historic structures of oppression and their contemporary manifestations. This is, we need to talk about reparations, and we need to talk about reparations now, not because we're looking to the past, but because we are in the present and must look to the future. It is situated within decolonial thinking and therefore proposes a decolonial way of thinking about global politics. That is transnational and rejects dichotomies of domestic and international it centers the social and economic well-being of marginalized and minoritized communities by prioritizing human dignity. And it's very much one that is forged in, as I said, transnational solidarity, but a global solidarity that definitely is about Africans and African descent people, but it's about, dare I say it, world peace. So in conclusion, I'm at a place now where I'm sort of respond, I'm, I'm going back to sort of the puzzles I set towards the beginning. How can Africa realize self-determination in this global hierarchical world? Um, what are the alternatives? And I'm not sure that I have an answer, but perhaps an indication of one which takes me back to my feminism. Things are messy. They will be very messy. Unlike what policymakers tend to like, which is a very straightforward answer about this is what you do, this is what you do for feminist peace, and it will get you this result. One of the things about that feminist part of it is sort of embracing the messiness and acknowledging that that future that we want, that potential alternative, is not going to be linear. And I guess in that sense, is able to sort of challenge even critical alternatives of what we want for peace. Um, and I'll stop there. Mr. Tsubei. Yeah. So, thank you so much. Sorry, that was really wonderful. I mean, I should say when your name first came up, we had a cluster meeting that we were just about where we said, we need someone for the annual politics lecture. It was kind of a quiet, and I think it was Hannah Marie almost at the same time said, Tony, and everyone yes, Tony, Tony, and all these people knew you. I said, who is this woman? <laughs> Now I will never forget you because it's, uh, no, you. it's really, really excellent. It's not at all my area, but extremely thought provoking. And um, there's a lot of food for thought there. So uh, Tony's very kindly agreed to take a few.